Not on camera, please. <laughs> Welcome to the garden show. And um, I don't know if you can see this uh, waggedy tail here, but he's wagging like crazy. I guess he likes to be a TV star. This Kusa dogwood. <laughs> he's making a face. Um, but he's a joyful creature and uh, he likes to keep me company. He's often snuggled up next to me, but we'll put him down for now. This week, right after, right after we got... Um, our new little adorable puppy, he, uh, Kusa Dogwood broke his toe. <laughs> so he's been a little uncomfortable, but he's doing much better now. I don't know how he broke his toe, but um, we took him to the vet and he was on all kinds. I even took a little x-ray of his little paw. Uh, it was just his little tiny pinky toe. I guess he got it caught on something and yanked, but he's doing, he's doing much better. So I hope everybody had a good week. We got a ton more rain, two and a half more inches of rain this week, which is, uh, significant probably good for a lot of the things we planted this year we wish you could have had some of that a little bit earlier uh, but it's it's good that the plants don't go into the winter dry so um, let me give the phone number because i um, hoping to hear from bob because he sent me some pictures i'd like to share and that number is 888-399-7344 that's peggy p-e-g-i and 7344. Again, 888-399-7344. We'll be here to about 11 o'clock to answer your gardening questions. So, you know, feel free to call at any point in time. Uh, last week, Chris called and was talking about S-hooks. We didn't call them S-hooks right away, but we figured out that he was talking about S-hooks. And to me, S-hooks are essential in the greenhouse. Absolutely essential. And I have this one which is a pretty big one i have a couple of these um and then i have a smaller one and they come in all kinds of various sizes so let's go to the slides and we can talk about that a little uh in a little bit more detail i really do have them everywhere um that pipe i have to be careful i can't hang really heavy things from that pipe that's an electrical conduit so I, I just put really small plants on there um, and, I, and they're a little bit further back from the greenhouse. So they need to be lower so that the light hits them. And so I use, you can see various sizes on the left there. They're actually strung together. That's really the way I store them, but they come in different lengths. And uh, that allows me, in addition to being able to adjust the hanger itself, the hooks really give me a way of maximizing the use of light so here's another situation this is the window that faces mm, mostly east and i have that little peg rack on the top that i hang a lot of plants from that's not the sunniest spot it does get some direct sun for sure and bright light all day so the philodendrons just thrive on that side in that spot but I really want to try to maximize the space. You can see I use that kind of smallish S hook to get it down below so that the pots aren't clanging into each other. Very useful. Now this is kind of interesting. This The wrought iron hanger here swings and it clearly has two places to hang things. But I had a really, I was in a really tight spot there. And if I tried to hang that little hanging plant on the middle hook that was part of the swinging hook, the pots would have just banged up against each other. So if you see very closely, I managed to use a little S hook, just a little tiny S hook to make use of another little bump on that. And that way everything fits perfectly. So they come in very handy. Tommy, do you remember where we got this weird thing? Uh, we were out together and they had a couple different kinds of this. And I was like, oh, let me try that. And I've completely forgotten where I got it, but I love it. 
Um, it sort of, sort of looks a bit like a fleur-de-lis and you have various places to hang things from. Uh, it's incredibly useful. And yeah, store, it was, it was a home store of some kind. I don't, I, I really don't remember, but if I ever see them again, I'll buy a stack of them because they'll make great presents as well. So, um, you can see, you can, I probably need to put something a tiny bit heavier on the right because it's annoys me that that thing doesn't hang straight. It's just, maybe I'm a little OCD, but, um, but that thing is, is really neat and very adaptable. You can see there that you've got, you know, multiple places to hang things from. And once again, I want to point out on the left here, looking at this screen, that that's one of those hangers that I use that I tie a knot in. I don't, necessarily cut the tops off you can easily enough which i did on the one on the right i did cut the top off but if you leave them not cut and you want to reuse them later longer you still have that option but certainly you know it's not a big deal if you choose to cut them they're not very expensive and they are very adaptable those jute ones the fancier white ones like the one on the bottom can we back up one slide please yeah that fancy one you really can't do much with the length of those once you get them, that's the length they are. That's why I really like the plain jute ones because they're just so adjustable. Okay, let's go forward too. All right, different kinds of S hooks that you can get. I think the one on the left is kind of cool because it's at a right angle. So if you need to twist something, turn it a different direction, um, it would be handy to have a couple of those around in case that would work. And the one on the right is coated, which means it's not gonna rust. And they come in bright colors. So if you, you know, trying to get color coordinated, if you go online, you can find them in all different kinds of colors and even different sizes. Uh, I thought this was a pretty good deal. Um, you get five for $3 and they're white, which kind of, you know, might work in certain situations, you know, if you're using them in your living room and you have white walls and you want them to kind of disappear, these would be nice. And these came from Ikea. We are planning to go to Ikea soon, right? So I'm going to look for these because it might be nice to have a pack sitting around. Um, not expensive at all. That's the other thing. $3 for five. So that was good. Okay. I found this one on Amazon. I have to say I love it. I, I don't know how great it is. They did do... Um, you know, a, a rating sit system on it and 30 different people gave reviews and it got 4.4 out of five stars. This one swivels and swiveling when you're dealing with hanging baskets or anything hanging, sometimes you want to get to the other side. Sometimes you want to be able to turn the plant because you want them to face the window or get better light, or you need to prune it on the other side, or it's got bugs or whatever, but being able to rotate it without having to take it down certainly has distinct advantages. Here's my problem. These are plastic and I just don't know how well they'll hold up. You can check it out on Amazon, see if they appeal to you. It's the only color they come in, which, you know, it isn't a really big deal. Um, I like colors, so it doesn't really bother me, but if you're looking for a particular decor, maybe it's not so good, but I love the idea that it swivels. These are pr very pretty and I love them. You know, they're really, really nice. And you get, they're not overly expensive. Again, these came from Amazon, but you can find them in lots of other places. Um, you get three in a pack for um, $26.99. So like a little less than 10 bucks each. Uh, which again, is not a terrible price for something decorative like that. They are very pretty and they are fairly sturdy. That doesn't necessarily say how big they are. I'm sure if you did a little more research, um, you could find that out, but they are, they are very pretty and they're pretty sturdy also as well. So now I just loved this one. Uh, this came from Ace Hardware, supposedly the helpful place. Uh, I agree. I've been to Ace Hardware's and they are helpful. But one of the reviews, actually two of the reviews, said when they actually ordered them and got them, they didn't have that cute little teeny tiny curly cue on the end. And uh, that would be very disappointing. I would find that very disappointing because that's what makes them special. So I don't know if they've corrected that. Um, I don't know if they're all come like that, but uh, I would be very careful before I bought these if that little curly cue is important to you. 
Uh, they're only about, uh, uh, three inches tall. They're not big ones. But again, you know, sometimes three inches is really all you need. All right. These are great. These came from Etsy. And I don't know how much you guys know about Etsy. I love Etsy. I don't shop there all the time, but I have found some wonderful things on Etsy. Um, a lot of the things at on Etsy are homemade or handmade and by craftspeople and artisans. And uh, these look like these were handmade. Each one is one of a kind. That's what OOAK means down there, one of a kind. And they're for $10.99. It's not a bad deal. And they would make great Christmas presents. However, I want to do this. This does not look difficult and it looks like it could be fun to make a bunch of these hangers and then you could give them as presents. You could buy them at a reasonable price. They're very decorative and $10.99 is a reasonable price for something so decorative, but it would also be a lot of fun to make them. I have tons of beads in boxes uh, with all my craft stuff. So if you could find the hooks, which I'm sure you could, it would be a really fun thing to try. Okay. Is that my last slide? That's my last slide. So we're going to go to the phones and we're going to go up to Metuchen. Uh, we have a lot of, a lot of listeners in Metuchen and we're going to say good morning to Danny. Hey, Danny girl, how are you? Good. Good morning, Peggy. Good morning. Greetings from Metuchen. Yes. I just came home from California. Oh, did you have a good time? And I like to, yes. And I like to uh, report that it was only the last weekend when I was there, I went to a local um, farmer's market that I purchased some jujubes because I knew that you just uh, bought a jujube tree. Yes. I had I had been trying to find jujubes that tasted like anything. Every time that when I went to the grocery store, if they sell them, I will buy them. I was always very disappointed. I'm like, why would anybody like this? It's tasteless. It's dry. There's no flavor, none whatsoever. And so this last weekend, when I bought some at this farmer's market, I was like, wow, now I know what good jujube tastes like. So what it did it taste so like? Flavorful. <laughs> it is, it's really hard to describe. It's jujube, actually, we use them a lot in, in oriental food. It's like the dates, the dry dates has a sweet and just very rich flavor. And this has that taste, but it's fresh. Okay, so... It's so amazing. So what was the difference? I mean, what do you think caused the difference? Do you think they need to be frosted like the persimmons? I don't know. I okay, really well, don't understand. Now so we need to I, do so, some serious research, Danny. We need to know. Right. So, so this is... Listen... I had I, I was flying home at two o'clock in the afternoon. I had to go to the farmer's market before I came home. So I purchased more of these jujubes. So you need you we need to get together so I can share some with you. Oh, that would so, be fun. And we can find out. We can find out what variety. While I was in the in the market, they there are two different um varieties. Sort of like the persimmon that right, one right. is, you know, different shape. So the one that I bought, it's more elongated, and it's like a larger shape of an olive, the longer olive, and the other one, it's rounder. So I just pulled up on a computer before I got on the phone with you. They do have two different shapes. So we need to find out what variety this is. Okay. So well, we will definitely so you can pursue get one, this. And so you can get one and, and make sure you have a good tasting variety well, I, of the jujube. Mine is already planted. So let's keep our fingers crossed that it tastes good. Um, I already have right. a persimmon that tastes awful. I'm really, I'm actually, up until yesterday, I was seriously thinking about taking the persimmon down because I have so many other right. things out there. And originally when we bought tiny farm. Um, we did not intend to keep those trees. Um, they were right in the middle of the yard and I really didn't want them. So we had cut them down and I decided what I wanted from those trees was to have three different heights so that I could put things on them like statues and pots of flowers and just to be kind of a focal point, but I didn't want them as trees. 
two of the trees just died. Um, they were cut at different heights and the two shorter ones never came back. They sent a couple side shoots up from the base, but nothing big. But the tallest one completely resprouted and has a full head of, of branches. It's, you know, very full, very lush and kind of nice that the fruits are quite reachable because, you know, I had cut it way back. Um, but as you and I have discussed, fruits taste terrible. They just, no matter what we right. do, I've tried them late. I've tried them, you know, after they've been frosted, I've tried leaving them on a windowsill until they get wrinkled. They never taste good. They taste just awful. And of course, my guess is that they grew from seed. And when they come from seed, you never know, you know, the quality of the fruit that you're going to get. So right. I've been thinking, okay, I really don't need this tree. It's got a really big head. It takes up a lot of visual space and it's in the way of seeing a lot of other things that I planted that I really like. It's not a horrible tree, but you know, it's not doing anything for me. And I get mad at it every time I see those stupid fruits on there that taste so awful. But yesterday, Danny, I was looking at it and it is covered in little orange fruits and it looks, it's so beautiful. I mean, it tastes awful, but it looks so beautiful and autumny and such a nice orangey pumpkin-y color. And so it, it's 15 minutes of fame is when all the leaves have fallen off, but the fruits are still on there. And it, it looks like it's covered in little orange ornaments. And it really right. is. Lantern. Yeah. It's really beautiful, but tastes awful. So I don't know. Maybe. I definitely lost at least one other tree back there this year to, a, I'm pretty sure, a disease. My hawthorn just shriveled up branch by branch and... Uh, I have been unable to find out exactly what the disease is, but it looks like it's internal. And so I don't want to replace it, uh, at least with an, another hawthorn. So um, if I take that down, because it's almost completely dead now, maybe that'll make the persimmon more acceptable since there's a little bit more open space. I don't know. I haven't decided. I'll have to right. give some thought to it, but I'm not, I haven't just come to a conclusion. I had concluded I'm taking it down. And then I looked at it yesterday and I was <laughs> like, it's so beautiful right now. So I don't know, you know, and there's not a lot of things that are magnificent now, you know, and right. so that kind of makes it special because it's magnificent now when, you know, not a lot of other things are, I mean, what else looks fabulous at this time of year? The beauty berry looks fabulous. Um, that um, the plant, the coral berry that I planted last week, that looks, I'm hoping the, the berries are really spectacular. So I'm hoping that will be fabulous. The um, Maximilian sunflowers, they're gorgeous at this time of year, but there's, you know, everything else is fading. So do I really want to get rid of something that's magnificent now? I don't know. You're going to have to talk me into it one way or the other. I haven't decided. Well, you know, just think about it. You don't have to do much more work and it's there. True. True. That is true. And it, it's, right? pretty, it's pretty much, yeah. you know, self-sufficient. It's got a really nice shape on the top. It's very rounded. It has like a perfectly almost uh, spherical top now. It's big and full. And I'll take a picture of it and show you guys next week. Because, and then maybe then you can help me decide. What do you think? Okay. Okay. So, like I said, we will have to make plans, and so I can share that with you. That would be great. That um, was so sweet. And of then you. we and need to, and then we need to figure out which type, because my sister said, "Once you figure it out, let me know." Because she's <laughs> okay. in California, the, <laughs> okay. the climate is much, much more suitable to grow any kind of fruit. So she might wanted to, you know, plant one in her yard. Well, we will. I know they, it. they came from uh, Fresno area in California, so that's the fruit basket of the you know of the california all right well this is all useful information so we will definitely pursue right. that okay i'm glad you okay. had a good I trip i'm glad you're question. home yes i have one more question remember my poor um red bud the top was yes. all dried up yeah it looks so like it's split a good or something time for me to yeah, when will be a good time for me to cut it? Should I do them now or should I wait till the spring? I'd wait till spring. Just, I mean, if it's dead, okay. it doesn't really matter so much. But I'd wait right. till spring just right. to see what comes back. And then you'll be sure you're not cutting off anything you want to keep. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, you have a great day. Thanks for calling and thanks for the info on the jujube. That's pretty exciting. 
Okay. All we'll right. Talk hugs. soon. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. Okay. Have a great day. You too. All right. So we were talking about S hooks, and um, I, I I have these other hooks. You know, the S hooks have to hang on something, and I really have a tremendous collection of different kinds of hooks in the greenhouse to hang things from. But I I was at the place where I buy a lot of these things, which happens to be Hobby Lobby. I love going to Hobby Lobby. Um, and uh, I was there for an entirely different reason. And I saw my favorite hooks there and I was, and they were on sale half price. That's one of the things they go on sale at Hobby Lobby half price, like every other week, they have a whole bunch of things that they do that with and, and the hooks and the knobs, which are all grouped together. Well, they happened to be on sale yesterday while I was there. Was it yesterday? Yesterday or the day before. So this, I love these. They're very sturdy and they, they hang from a, a, a nail in the back or actually I, I try to use a screw because that's a little sturdier uh, and I put a screw in the back. Um, and they just, they look really fun even when nothing is hanging on them. So I probably have five or six in the greenhouse already, but um, I picked up two more and I'm sure I can find spots for them. So uh, again, so full price, these were 1099 and they were on sale for half price. So, uh, and they have other really cool hooks too, but, but I, those are my favorites. So, all right. So no, let me give the phone number again. I'm hoping Bob will call. I'm hoping he's up to giving us a call. Number here is 888-399-PEGGY, P-E-G-I. That's 7344. Uh, we have four open lines. Again, we're going to be here till 11 o'clock. We have lots of things that I want to talk to you about. Um, Tommy, do we have the pictures this week at Tiny Farm from last week? Because they were, I didn't, um, I didn't ever get to show them to you and I don't want to get too far behind. So, um, so we can definitely talk about that because there is a lot of stuff going on there and uh, I don't, I almost prepared a slideshow that had some duplicates in it. And I was like, you know what? That's, that's really not a good idea. Let's, um, all right. Well, my Tommy's finding that we're going to go over here and we're going to open this up. They, um, can they see me? Can my listen? Okay. So I have this box that came in the mail. We did get Quite a few boxes, uh, boxes, uh, bulbs planted this week. I didn't get all of them planted. And I do have a bit more of a report about the bulb planter. The bulb planter is only applicable, only useful under certain circumstances. I know it's a very cool bulb planter and we've shown it before with the tube. I, I couldn't use it to plant the crown imperials. The crown imperials were too big. They would not fit. So that was a little bit of a problem and they worked great with most of the alliums. One got stuck. Um, they would be perfect for daffodils and tulips, which is what people plant the most of, but they get planted six to eight inches down. And that is the only depth the bulb planter works at. So for the other bulbs, a lot of the other alliums I was trying to plant, they only went three inches down and it really didn't work. So it doesn't work with bulbs that are planted a little more shallowly and it doesn't work with bulbs that are too big. So it has some distinct disadvantages, but if you're planting a lot of tulips or daffodils, I think it would work really great. So after trying it a couple of times, that's my evaluation. All right. So this order came from Bluestone. Bluestone? Bluestone perennials, and they have an excellent reputation. And I only got two things from them. Oh no, I only got one thing from them. Um, what I got was my magic lilies. So can you see? Can you see that? Lycoris guamajira. And this is those ones that come up with foliage in the spring and then uh, come up the foliage completely disappears and then they bloom in August. So I got three. Ooh, 
So I got three, and with the other bulbs that I had from, I think, Rex, we should, that'll be the end of it. So this week we should finish up getting all the bulbs planted, which is good because that means they'll be finished in um, October, which is the ideal planting time. So are we having trouble finding it? Was it two weeks ago, the 8th? Because I don't find something for the 15th. All right, well, maybe it was the 8th. Let's try that one. Okay, so the slides are coming. Coming. Okay. Okay, let's do this week for now while you can while you can try to find the other one. There we go. All right, so this is um, a pumpkin. It's a pumpkin that TJ gave me. He thinks it would be a good choice for me to use to make pies. It looks like a print, one of the princess pumpkins. And they are they supposedly make really good pies. I've always used either Hubbard's or cheese pumpkins. Uh, but this is a really beautiful pumpkin, and it supposedly has good flesh, sweet for making pies. So I haven't decided if I really want to go through all that work of cooking down the pumpkin. Maybe I just want to enjoy this pumpkin as a beautiful pumpkin, but we'll see. Um, in the meantime, I appreciate that he gave it to me. So that's sitting there. Oh, I found this little guy in my basement. It was really a little upsetting. I think it, I don't hate snakes. I don't want them in my basement, but I, I certainly, if I had found him, I would have let him go outside. Unfortunately, my cat found him first. So he's no longer with us, but that is the first time I've ever found a snake in the house. Um, I wouldn't object if it was the last time I ever found a snake in the house, but if I ever find another one, oh, and it was kind of interesting because I found a dead snake by the mailbox that had been mowed, you know, uh, run over by a car and it was over by the mailbox. So um, apparently the snake is now, it would look like it was the same kind of snake. So um, is in my neighborhood. Okay, this is the, uh, the um, crown imperials that I planted. Uh, again, I, I could not use the bulb planter. They need to go six, eight inches down and they needed to be um, a, about a foot apart. So they are in a very key spot, fairly close to the road um, in front of my wizard statue. Uh, so they're kind of nicely spaced in front of the wizard. You can see the bottom of the wizard statue there. And um, I'm very excited because these were these are spectacular and they last for a really long time. So we, we will see. And again, they are nobody eats them. They're pretty considered poisonous and nobody eats them and they last for many years. So even though they were like twelve dollars each, something like that, they're uh, they're an investment. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that they do well. This is the Maximilian sunflowers. They make me very happy to look at them. They are very dependable. They come back year after year. Um, I have them in a really good spot because they're up against a cinder block wall and they're not planted with anything else. So even though they can spread, I can mow right up to the bed where I want them or my mowing man can mow right up to the bed so can keep them contained without them spreading or complicating things in other beds with other plants. I didn't have it set up that way at Blooming Acres. They were scattered among other things. And then it was a little problematic because they were popping up where I really don't want them. Um, but this is a bed. They're in there all by themselves. They get really thick and, uh, and I just, you know, mow right up to them. So it works out really well. This is the Elven ears. That's Jordan right there. For, not, a, not a great shot of her, but we, we were working. Uh, those are the two giant pots of Elven ears that we brought from the Ocean Grove house. They had to get into the greenhouse. Uh, the greenhouse has standing room only. And in some places you can only move sideways. It's very, very full. I had to cut back some of the leaves on this. We found a couple of good spots for them in the greenhouse. Uh, but a few leaves were just covering other plants. So we did cut them back a little bit. They're enormous. Um, we repotted them this year. They look great in the red pots at the house in Ocean Grove, which is yellow with red and blue trim. So, um, but they're very heavy and they're very big. <laughs> so 
haven't decided if we're going to try to repot them next year. They do tend to die back quite a bit over the winter, so probably by the spring they'll be okay. Oh, this is a begonia from that Anne Marie gave me, and it's the second one she gave me. The first one just never, never did well, but this one is gorgeous and it's really put out all that new growth. The the long stems that you're looking at, where you can see the reddish stems sticking out, those were the leaves that it came with. But all of that nice, compact new growth in the center is all, that is all new growth. And I just think the foliage is just so beautiful. So I'm very pleased with that. Ah, the banana trees. These are not the same banana trees that Mike has at Mike's uh, nursery in Delhi over there in Millstone. His are actually banana producing bananas. Mine do not produce anything edible, but they are supposedly hardy. And this was the first year they were in the ground. They will die down to the ground completely. We will have to mulch them heavily, which is fine. Just pour a bunch of bags of mulch around it. It's in a kind of a nice spot where mulching it will be relatively easy. And, um, and supposedly, you know, eventually they can get to be 10 or 12 feet high. We'll see. I tried them once before, but the first year it just struggled. I'm not sure why. And they never came back. These are thriving. So I think they have a really good shot at surviving and coming back next year. I'll keep you posted on that. Of course, there are things blooming here and there. And uh, what would the fall be without chrysanthemums? This is a chrysanthemum that has uh, that came back from last year. I think it actually came back from the year before that. It's very robust. Uh, these two, the one on the left is one that I just planted. The one on the right is a slightly lighter shade of of pink than the first one I showed you. Uh, the pink one came back. The orange one is new. We'll see how it does next year. But um, why I like to find things other than chrysanthemums to bloom at this time of year, what would the fall be without mums? They will provide all the, the wonderful color and flowers that we come to expect at this time of year. And But I do need to say that if you want your chrysanthemums to be perennial, you really are so much better off if you plant them in the spring. And you can buy them lots of times at garden centers, you can buy them even in flats. They just look like just green foliage, like flats of lettuce, and you can plant them, but then they will be established all summer. And so uh, when it comes to the following winter, they'll have a much better root system. When you plant them in the fall, uh, when they already have flower buds, they're busy working on flower buds. They're not going to make roots. So you have a very slim chance of them overwintering. That doesn't mean you shouldn't plant them. You just have to plant them realizing that they're probably not going to come back. Okay, so let's uh, go back to me. And do we have any callers? Because I two. might. Yeah, two. Okay, well, I can't see them at the moment. I'm not sure what's going on with my screen. Oh, oh, it's Bob. Oh, good. So then let's put up Bob's slides too. So Bob's calling us from Piscataway. Bob, are you with us? Bob, are you with us? Oops. Hey, Bob. Yes, I'm sorry. I had the phone. I had the phone on mute. I'm sorry. <laughs> that makes it tricky. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't work. Yes. <laughs> so, so I am now with you. So how are you feeling? Uh, uh, taking a one hour at a time. Okay. Well, I'm it's sending you good. a hug. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. So it's these are the, this is the first picture that you sent me and you sent me a note saying that your lilacs are blooming. Now, obviously I blew up the bloom. The picture on the left is very blurry because I enlarged it so much, but yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, the pictures weren't the best anyway, but you can see that it, it is blooming and uh, it's lost most of its leaves, which is perfectly normal at this time of year. Uh, but it's put out a few flowers. Um, I have two things to say about that. One is the bloomerang lilac is supposed to do that. And obviously they developed that plant and they bred that plant so that it would do that. But the plant had to have had the ability to do that somewhere in its genetic makeup in order to find it through any kind of reading program. It had to be there. They, they, they couldn't invent it. I don't think they're quite into gene splicing on lilacs yet. So 
all so that i'm saying it must have that ability to some degree is it unusual yes have i ever seen it before no but i did notice that my bloomerang lilacs in ocean grove have more reblooms at this time of year this year than they have in past years so that's an indication that environmental conditions are more conducive to that so that's one whole thing that i want to say that uh, the plant must have that ability. The other thing I want to say is that this happens all the time with azaleas. And again, there are now azaleas that are sold as reblooming azaleas. But I, for many, many years, people would say, oh, my azaleas are putting out flowers. Are they going to die? And I would say um, over and over that probably not that, you know, that looks like there's a lot of flowers on there because, you know, it's like a match in a dark room. One match in a dark room looks like a lot of light, but when you have a match on a sunny day, you can't tell any difference. Um, a few flowers on an azalea, or in this case, a lilac, um, draw your eye because there are so few of them and you, you notice, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to affect the bloom in the spring. It's just a couple, a few flowers less compared to hundreds, it's just a few flowers less. So more than likely, it's not going to affect your bloom in the spring. However, that's putting everything in a very positive light. The negative light, which of course there's a downside to everything, the negative part is it should be going dormant. And I'm a little concerned that if the weather turns very cold, very fast, that it's normal process of going from having leaves to being dormant with buds has been disrupted. And if we suddenly get very cold and it hasn't acclimated and gone fully dormant, it's a possibility it could be damaged. I think that that's less likely to happen, but that's out there too. And there isn't anything you can do about it. So just sit back and watch. Would the damage be to that one branch or to the entire plant? The plant's about 70 years old. It's a really large lilac bush. We have a couple of them. Um, would that just damage that one branch versus the whole plant? My guess is that it could damage the whole plant because the plant is, is clearly not going dormant. And I don't know that it, uh, I, I really don't know. I'm just guessing here, Bob, but it seems to me that the chemistry of the plant isn't branch by branch. It's the whole plant. So if the whole plant is not going dormant, I don't think it would just be this one branch is not going dormant. That doesn't make sense mm -hmm. to me. Um, possible okay. though. I mean, plants do weird things, but um, so I think that there is a good possibility that if it is damaged, that you could see damage on the whole thing, but also the plant has a lot of, you can see in that picture of the overview, that it has a lot of large woody branches. And the larger woody branches would be less likely to be damaged under any circumstances. So I'm thinking that if it shows signs of damage in the spring, it would be the skinnier branches, maybe uniformly on the plant, but not the whole thing, unless it's a really extreme okay. situation. So I think okay. that you just need to keep an eye on it. You may lose some of the skinny branches at the tips if it's not dormant, and you may not lose anything at all. But the only way to tell is to wait and see what happens. Okay. And we also had a pear tree, which is about 20 feet away from there, um, about two weeks ago. That had flowers on it also. A lot or just a few? Just a few. Yeah, I think the same thing. You know, with the, the weather in this fall, we've had so much rain and um the weather's been mild so they may be confused obviously you have both the pear tree and the lilac that are confused so they're obviously confused i think they're probably all going to be fine and i think you're probably not going to okay. notice much of a difference in the spring that's what i'm hoping for i think that's what's likely but there's no guarantee okay okay does that yep do you have any more questions yeah, well, about yeah, that we'll just be patient with it Yes. Yeah, I was just curious as to why, I mean, and I've lived here pretty much my whole life. This, I can't ever recall having seen this before. And that's definitely a possibility. That's definitely a possibility. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on. Okay. You sent me a picture of these. Have you tried them? 
Um, what I am not looking at the screen oh, it's because the, my the wife Oreo cookies that you sent me a picture oh. of that I am just <laughs> I so. You were talking about the popcorn. Scene. No, no. Well, we'll get uh, to that too. Yes. But, but yes, yes really, I have. Yes. Are they as yes. good as regular Oreos? Uh, they're they're the same thing. It's just they have um, Halloween decorations on the cookie, and the icing is orange. Okay, so my uh, my burning question is: Did you actually get an exclamation point? On the cover, the cover, the, the oh. front of the bag, it says boo in Oreo cookies with orange cream. And there is an exclamation point of a cookie with orange cream on it. And it says five spooky Halloween designs. So is there an exclamation point? I have to look and see. I have to look and see and get back to you. I've only, I only uh, opened it up yesterday. I had a few only, but... Uh... Yeah, I try to pace myself with that stuff because it's easy enough to knock a whole pack out. Oh, yeah. You know, really oh, yeah. Quick. Yeah, so I'm trying to pace myself. Um, but that's something I have to do some research on that <laughs> okay, now. Okay, well. All right, well, you got to promise me you're going to get back research. to me. This is very important. Yes. You need to get back to me on this. And I'm going, I'm probably going to go to the one. supermarket today. If I see them, I will buy them for sure. We have to add this to the whole collection of the Oreo world. So thank you for oh, sending cool. me that. Okay. Yes, so yes. Tommy next. Okay. So here's the popcorn plant and yours obviously did better than mine. I do not know why uh, mine just, they, they're blooming now, but they're not, they, they bloomed very late and they didn't get half the size that they did the year before. I cannot, tell you why i just i had the same problem with the mexican petunias that they just didn't grow they were planted in good spots with lots of sun they were watered they just didn't grow i don't know if it was the heat and the dry ground because i do have a problem my ground is so dry with the sand base that's in most of the area where the gardens are that it does dry out very quickly so maybe it was just the heat and the drought but yours obviously did well so i did a little blow up and it looks like you've got a couple of developing seed pods on the, that's the blow up is from the picture on the right. Um, those little kind of flat green, they look leafy, but I'm not sure if they're leafy. Yes. Yes. That looks like those are developing seed pods. I have one developing seed pod on, um, on one of my plants. And oh, now I'm looking closer at the big picture, not the close up. And it definitely looks like you've got a seed pod on the far left. There's kind of a curly, slightly wavy S shaped thing sticking out. And that could be a seed pod because that's what they look like when they're mature. So it looks like oh, okay. there's a cup, a good possibility that you're going to get some, but I'm going to tell you, Bob, last year, my popcorn plants were ginormous. They were over my head. They're only half the size wow. this year. And they were covered wow. in flowers, just covered in flowers and for the whole, for half the summer, well into the fall. And at the end of the season, when I went to try to gather uh, seed pods out of these ridiculously huge plants, I only got like seven seed pods. They're not really good at making seed. And when I'd grown them before, I never found any. Um, so I went online and searched and searched. It took me a while to find somebody who was able to sell me the seed pod, the seeds themselves. And that's what I started these from. So I've been growing these for a few years now and saving the seed, but I don't know if I'm going to get any seeds this year. We'll just have to see. I don't, I really am flummoxed as to why they didn't do well this year. So. Yeah. The, these flowered, um, I guess, September, mid September right. or so uh, they flower really late. Um, with the seed pods now, do I just leave this on the plant until the stem completely dies off and then pick them up off the ground? Do I cut them off now? Well, I, I guess I have to leave them on so they develop. Right? I would leave them on for a while. Keep an eye on them. Okay. They turn sort of brownish. And when they turn sort of brownish, that was when I harvested them. Um, but the they're, flowering, where the they're flowering so late that you want to leave them on as long as possible. Okay. Okay. I'll put some cardboard under it to collect them. Then if they drop, yeah. There would you, you go. like some if I get them? I would love some, I, but it 
if okay. you only get a few, um, I'll, I'll track them down again. I don't want to take them if you just have a few. And I might still get a couple. We, I don't know. I haven't seen uh, the weather. The last time I checked, there still wasn't a frost in the forecast, but that can change any any minute at this point. We're already past and they the, didn't. These didn't get too tall until late in the season. They they finished at around uh, maybe five foot, four and a half foot, but they were really short for most of the summer. It wasn't until late August that they started taking off and growing tall. So yeah, I had um, the same experience. I don't know. I, again, I think it had to do with the heat in July. That's the only thing I can think of. Hmm. So, all right. Is there? I think that was the last. Um, of the pictures that you sent me. So thanks for sending them. That was fun. And oh, you're welcome. Um, I will report back on the Oreos. Yeah, very good. We'll do some uh, studies here. Okay. All right. You have a great day. Um, I have one other question. Oh, okay. We Go have for a, it. A, yeah, we have a plant growing right near that lilac I, I showed you. Um, initially, it had a purple flower on it, a tubular flower. And the leaves, I, I thought it was an eggplant. Like, wow, we have a wild eggplant growing somehow. But it turns out it looks like it's a Jimson weed. It has spiky, oval-shaped, small balls on it. Uh, and Nancy did research on it, and she said it's a Jimson weed. Yeah, Datura. Um, I should take that out, correct? I think they're really cool. I think they're very cool. And they have beautiful flowers. So, um, But they're also um, a hallucinogen. So you don't want anybody to eat it. Um, I right. think the seed pods are really interesting looking. Um, kind yes, of, they are. You know, so um, it's entirely up to you. It's one of those weed situations. It's a weed if you don't. Are want they it. are they poisonous? Well, for animals. Well, they're a hallucinogen. So yes, I guess we could say that they're poisonous. And I could would say that I wouldn't want my animals eating them for sure. I don't know if they're deadly poisonous. I don't know. They could be. I don't know. Um, I know I, I saw a patch of them growing outside the East Windsor Police Department one year, which I thought was, <laughs> was kind of interesting. interesting. Um, I'm assuming that they were weeds and no and they didn't know what they were. I would think that they should know what they were, but they didn't at the time. Um, mm -hmm. So they, and they are native. So, you know, it's certainly possible that they just- Oh, they are you, native, okay. Yeah, yeah, the Indians called them loco weed. I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> so, and there's- It is an interesting looking plant though. Yeah, it is and, for and sure. The, the flowers Very are nice looking and the seed pods are, like, wait a minute, what is this? They're really yeah, cool. I know. They, they're very Halloween-y. They're very Halloween-y. Yes, yes, very Halloween-y. And exactly. I took um, the first house we had in Ocean Grove, the first beach house, we painted a, a pumpkin-y orange. And I had some of those, uh, one of the more ornamental varieties, growing in front of the foundation of the house, which was painted this pumpkin-y orange. And so I took pictures of the seed pods with their variegation and weirdness in front of the orange wall. It was the coolest Halloween picture I ever took. You know, it was oh, so Halloween-y. I loved it. So they are cool looking. So, you know, enjoy them for that. And if, you know, if not, enjoy them for now. Yank them. Don't let them grow next year. Or if you like them, save the seed and start a few. Either way, whatever works for you. Okay, I wouldn't smoke good. it, though. Nancy's, or... Nancy is... No, I, I, yeah, definitely not. <laughs> Nancy's doing the research now on the spooky Oreos, and she said, no, negative, there is no exclamation point. Oh, that's too bad. Okay. Or maybe you'll get the lucky pack that has it. Who knows? <laughs> maybe they didn't make them. Who knows? Well, thank you for the research. I appreciate that and the picture. All yeah. right, you guys have a great day. Yes, thank you for taking my call, Peggy. Take my care. pleasure. All right, bye-bye now. And we have another bye. caller who's bye -bye. next. Who, oh, it's Anne Marie. Hey, Anne Marie, how you doing? Good. I'm good. Good morning. Good morning. Where are you? I hear you way in the background there. Well, I was watering my plants. That's my job when I'm listening to you. Well, that seems extremely appropriate. Yes. <laughs> I know. I, otherwise, they might not get water till next Sunday. It's terrible. So, how are you guys doing? So, we're we're good. We're really good. Uh, your friend Arthur is doing quite well, two and a half weeks post-op, and he's dancing with a cane. 
There you go. I like it. Is that sort of like pole dancing? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not exactly. <laughs> well, okay. It, it was a, it was um, a good I thought. Like okay. Well, I actually called about amaryllis, but this is my two cents on your popcorn plant, which I brought the two in that I'm going to get to you. They continue to lose leaves, although the top is trying to make a new plant, you know, new leaves. So I can't tell you what they're going to survive till they get to your house. Well, we'll see. But, we'll do our uh, best to keep them going. And my Mexican petunia never bloomed. And I did have one that came up random in a pot from last year, and that one did not bloom. Yeah, so, I don't know so what's much. the story there. I don't know what's the story, but both those plants, both of which I love, and neither one did well for me or anybody else that I know of. I mean, they did, you know, the popcorn plants eventually bloomed, but compared to how they were last year, they were, you know, they were just a shadow of their former selves. They were really, uh, it was really disturbing. I don't know why. It was just really upsetting that that's what happened. So, um, okay. You have a question if for I me? If I could talk about Brillis. I yes. had them on my front porch all summer growing their multiple five and six leaves. And one had seven leaves. So I'm hoping that I'm going to get them to winter and then bloom again. But they really haven't had a good watering in over a month. And they're just as green as they ever were. I think three leaves came off of eight plants, period. So um, what am I going to do with them now before I have to bring them in in? Not well, you, you stopped watering them. Were they getting rained on? They only got the humidity from outside. They didn't really get rain. They're on the front porch. So the, oh, okay. you know, right. shelter. So um, just leave them alone. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a secret. Now, don't tell anybody this. Okay? It's yeah, just right. between you and me. Um, I do nothing to my amaryllis. I do nothing. I know. So when, when do you decide to bloom if you do nothing? They bloom in the spring. Do they ever lose their green leaves? Gradually, slowly, yes. Okay. But I never, I do not bother forcing them into dormancy. I just let them do whatever it is that they're doing. And generally they bloom, you know, the, in the greenhouse, they get plenty of light. So they get plenty of leaves. And in the spring, they bloom. They don't bloom at Christmas, but I'm, you know. I'm not fanatical about that. They no, I don't care. Well, I want them to bloom. Actually, I want to. I want them to go dormant. I want to water them when I get home from my winter in Florida, and there's nothing going to bloom for me. So I, uh, you know, I want to water them. How long are you going to be gone? About six weeks. Six weeks. They'll probably be fine. They'll well, probably I'm going to bring them in. They get stored in the basement because I have no place else to store them. So so they if go they to the okay, basement, they eventually up and go away so i should just leave them alone and let them dry up yes okay just checking that's what i would because do. i've never gotten leaves i'm so happy i think uh that's all you i think that's all you need to do bring them in um the leaves will dry up they'll have some the i think that's probably your best bet and then they'll start okay, them up and again i when did you move go. okay and i did move uh, uh half of my like six of my Christmas cactuses out to the front porch to get a, a chill and everybody else is going to get their chill from the bay window because they bloom anyway. So I'm going to see what happens. I'm doing a little project, little science project okay. here. I expect a report. Okay. So I'm just watching the temperature. If it's going to go down to 40, I guess I'll bring them in. Okay. Sounds okay. good. Yes. Because yeah. okay, they're also protected. They're, they're right up against the brick wall of the front porch. So it's not a problem. Okay, I don't think I have anything else exciting to share. Well, thank you for calling and sharing what you did, and I hope that we will see you guys soon. Okay, yes, hopefully we'll talk about that. Okay, okay. take Sounds care. Sounds good. All right, thanks for calling, Emery. Hugs all around. Talk to you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Okay, we um, have six minutes. Let's do the chicken pumpkin, please. Okay, so... I told you in the past that I saw this video about how someone got their chicken to carve their pumpkin for them. And they did a really nice job. And I was very impressed. So I decided to give it a, a whirl. So I used a magic marker and drew a little pumpkin face. 
that was a pretty good pumpkin face, right? I mean, it looks pretty balanced. So then I took a drill and I drilled all around the perimeter and then of the and then in the middle as well, um, in the mouth and the nose and the eyes. I did a, a lot of drilling. You could see that it was disturbed enough so that um, the chickens would know that that's where they're supposed to peck. I had a lot of fun doing this. So, okay. So this is me carrying this big old pumpkin out to the chicken coop. We decided to give it to the, the big chicken coop because I have two chicken coops to keep the rooster separate. So it was going in into this space. And you can see, look, they're like two different chickens. As soon as I put the thing down, they were very interested in, in doing this, you know, job, getting this job done. Um, on the right, that's red. And on the left, not sure which chicken that is, but uh, that's one of the one of the uh, comments. Okay, so they didn't quite color in the lines. <laughs> they seem to, you know, want to express their own uh, artistic uh, energies here, and they did some of what they were supposed to do, but. That's how it ended up, which is not exactly what I had in mind, it's scary. but it is very scary. It is a very scary looking pumpkin. And I was afraid to leave it in, in there any longer for fear that, you know, it would lose all definition of shape. Um, but the picture on the left, please note, they got every single seed out of there. They got all the seeds. You got to commend them for effort. They got all the seeds. So this poor pumpkin, it's not exactly what I hoped, but definitely they made an effort, um, you know, and it's scary. So I guess you know, there's something to be said for that. But that was my, uh, that was my pumpkin experiment. Okay. So now um, there was a cup. Can we do this week? Oh, no, let's do the ampelopsis. I'm very excited about that. Let's do the ampelopsis. So I um, had some place that I had to go and um, and I got out of the car. I went into the, the place where I was going. I was only in there about 15 minutes. I came out, got in the car and I noticed um, this plant with these blueberries and I was fascinated by it. It did not look particularly familiar to me. So I went home and I looked it up and I, there was, you know, these are really blue. I thought they were really quite beautiful. Um, and it has these, you know, kind of heart-shaped leaves, indented heart-shaped leaves, but really pretty. And it turns out it's called the heart-leafed pepper vine, Ampelopsis cordata. And um, I, I'd never heard of it before. And it was referred to as a liana. Again, another term I've really never heard before. And that is a woody plant with a vine-like growth habit. I imagine there's a lot of things that we grow um, that could be considered a liana. And this particular species, it's a southern species, um, but it's also found in Maryland, Delaware, and Connecticut, all of which where it's considered introduced. Nowhere could I find a listing for this being in New Jersey. Uh, that's the flowers that it gets, kind of, you know, not too exciting, very small. And this, however, is a relative. This is Ampelopsis brevipedi okay, brevipedunculata. And this one is considered invasive and is found in New Jersey. But if you can look at the foliage, the foliage is very different. This is not the one that I saw. This one is, um, again, the berries are beautiful, but this is, this is not the one I found. And this one is considered invasive. So I thought that was really interesting that I found a different species that um, is no one has ever recorded being here. I suppose it's possible I got it wrong, but the foliage is completely different. So I don't think I was too far off. Uh, and that is the flowers of um, that variety. So if you see them, you, you know, you may not want to keep them because they are invasive, but I, I have to admit that 
those blueberries are really quite stunning. Um, don't recommend you planting it, but you can admire it from afar. So I think that's, is that, that's the end of that one. So, all right, I think we've pretty much gotten to, there aren't any more callers, are there? Okay, so we've pretty much gotten to the end. Oh, I really wanted to show you this stuff I found out about capers. And let's just bring up the Katona Farm sign at the beginning. Yeah, we'll just show that to wrap things up. Um, Katona Farms um, is in Chesterfield. And that is the farm that my son manages. And I... The weather has been so uncooperative for pumpkin rides. The weekends have been awful. Um, and so this weekend and next weekend is really the last opportunity to do that. So can we get to the last slide? Okay, so this is if you want to go for a pumpkin ride and you want to pick pumpkins and uh, go, go for, a, I'm sorry, a hay ride. And um, this is where you can go. And it's um, in Chesterfield and not not too difficult to get to. And certainly you can look up their website for specific directions. So that pretty much wraps up the show for this week. I, uh, I was a little concerned about when daylight savings time was going to end, but not until November 5th. So not next weekend, the weekend after that. So just keep that in mind, but I will be here during daylight savings time for the last time next week, but I will be here every week after, as far as we know. And until then, you guys have a good one. Bye-bye now.